Welcome to our segment of Joy in Our Town. This is our community issue program, and we're so glad you're with us today. I'm Pat McGuffin, your host today, and a local businessman and pastor here in Orange County. And with us today, we have Dr. Kevin Shuren, who is currently the director of the and health officer of the Florida Department of Health here in Orange County. So welcome, Dr. Kevin. We're glad to have you with us today. Well, thank you, Pat. Tell us a little bit about yourself, please. Well, I'm a, I'm a family doc. I practiced in Illinois for a number of years before coming to Florida. And so I'm obviously passionate about health care and about making people healthier, and that's what I came here to talk about today. Wow, well that's great, and I know specifically we're going to kind of zero in. Uh, there's probably many topics that we could talk about today that uh, you would have on your mind that we need to address here in Orange County, but uh, specifically we're going to zero in on a little tiny bug called the mosquito and the Zika virus that we hear about on the news and different other places. Tell us a little bit, what is a Zika virus? Well, the Zika virus has been around that we know of since 1947, Pat. It was discovered in the Zika forest in Uganda, okay? And it, it sort of stayed in that part of the world for a number of years and maybe in Southeast Asia as well. And then in around 2013, 2014, it seems to have popped up in this hemisphere. Okay. And particularly in Brazil, and then later on in Colombia, and now the rest has gotten all over the news because of the, the babies that were born in Brazil with microcephaly. So you've mm -hmm. heard about this, babies being born with very small heads, and that caused quite a bit of alarm. Yes, now how is, how is this <clears throat> virus is it exclusively transmitted by mosquitoes, or primarily at least? Primarily, yes. It, it can also be sexually transmitted as well, but that is much more rare. Mm -hmm. Primarily transmitted by mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. Now, um, living here in Orange County, Florida, we tend to have a few outsiders that come to our community, otherwise known as visitors to our community. They're coming here from all over the world. Um, they could have been infected somewhere, and now they're here. And um, so that does not poise a, a problem for us here with our own mosquito base, does it? At this point, we have zero, none, no mosquito transmission in Orange County or anywhere in the United States. That's the good news. The only exception to that is Puerto Rico. Hmm. So Puerto Rico has some transmission going on in Puerto Rico mm -hmm. because Puerto Rico has a lot of inland tropical forest, if you will. And so Puerto Rico is, is more like Brazil or some of the other Caribbean islands in that respect. And they really can't control the mosquito populations as well as we do here in the state of Florida or the rest of the United States. So it's one type of mosquito, the Aedes aegypti, that we are most concerned about and that's the one that seems to carry the mosquito, I mean, I'm sorry, the Zika virus the most. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned uh, about the birth defects that they have found in Brazil and other places and, and I just saw in the news yesterday uh, that it was announced uh, here in Florida we had our first baby born with, um, with birth defects. Yes, and this, it's important to say to our folks here in Florida that this baby the mom was from Haiti. So in other words, mom acquired the virus from presumably mosquitoes in Haiti before she came to the state of Florida. So this was not a case acquired in the state of Florida. And that the mom who gave birth to the baby with the microcephaly, it was not attributable to the state of Florida, although she gave birth here. Mm -hmm. It was attributable to the nation of Haiti, mm -hmm. which is a known country that has the the mosquito transmission of the Zika virus. Mm -hmm. So I guess something that uh, jumps into my mind is uh, someone is in another nation that has this virus pretty prevalent um, through the mosquito population. They get bit. They come to the United States, Central Florida. Um, we have tons of lakes around here. We have mosquitoes ourselves, and I know we try and control that. Um, but if our mosquito bites the infected person, 
can that mosquito then transmit the virus here in Florida? Sure, it's, it's, it's possible, and that's, that's probably the greatest concern that we have. So what we do is we do surveillance and we do mosquito control. So when we identify somebody who is a traveler, and I can tell you right now we have 15 travelers that we've identified in Orange County who have had the Zika virus since we began tracking this. Now that's just one example of one county in your viewing area. So other counties are also doing the same thing. We're tracking those travelers. Those travelers would be instructed to stay at home while they're symptomatic, right? So presumably they're not out and about where they're going to be bit by mosquitoes. They would be given some instructions to wear mosquito repellent and so forth. And we're trying to protect them from that. Now, yes, it's theoretically possible if a mosquito were to bite them that it could transmit the virus. That's what we want to prevent. So in a word, we're trying to protect our Florida mosquitoes from biting people who carry the, the Zika virus. That's another way of looking at this. And right now, fortunately, the only people carrying the virus are those travelers. We want to keep it that way. So let's <laughs> say, uh, uh, well, I guess the question becomes how do we have lots of travelers. We have lots of travelers that are visitors to our parks. We have lots of people that travel for business or pleasure here in Florida. Um, and they come back. Are there symptoms, known symptoms that they would know they perhaps contracted this virus? Right. So the symptoms would be the red eyes, the, the fever, the headache, the joint pains, the rash. So you need two out of four symptoms in order to be a suspect case, to have a traveler who's had two out of four symptoms, and then we would consider testing them. And so, yes, there's a protocol for testing them, and then the mosquito control of the county would go out and do spray and sweeps in the area around where that individual lives. So we're trying to control those mosquitoes in the area around where we identify people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's, uh, uh, I guess, a, a situation where here are people that are coming in. Um, they could have these symptoms, and but I have to tell you, some of these symptoms that you named are, I'm thinking, red eyes, okay, so don't stay up late because you, you might have had red eyes, and joint pain, oh my goodness, I never have joint pain. <laughs> you know, that's why. So in other words, um, tell me about this rash. That one, when you said that, that, that probably, that looks different than just perhaps a mosquito bite sure. bump. What, what does so, a rash look like? Well, it would be a, a a rash related to a virus where it's a generalized rash. You break out all over, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're talking about joint pains that are not just one joint, but all over. Right. Uh, like the chikungunya virus, these are in the same family, or the dengue virus, multiple joints. So you have a flu-like illness. You ache all over. You have a, you know, a significant fever. You have the, the eyes that are very red. You know, when you get two out of four of these symptoms, that should set up alarm bells that okay, doctor, we want to, we all want to think about ordering a test. Right? Now, because of the magnitude of the potential risk, uh, I realize at this point is primarily potential, it sounds like. Um, when someone goes in for a regular doctor checkup and they have their blood drawn for um, analysis by the doctor, um, is it a routine thing now for them to automatically check for oh, this? Or oh, no. Oh, no. But if there's a history of travel, See, we're not seeing the, the localized transmission yet, but if there's a history of travel to one of these countries, then that should trigger the line of questioning. So you're going to see people who have the red eyes and the joint pains and so forth, but the, if the, there is the history of travel to one of these countries, that should trigger the line of questioning, much as we did with Ebola before. You know, mm -hmm. the countries that were involved with Ebola in West Africa. So um, what steps can, um, can, can our citizens and our visitors take uh, that would help them in uh, having some protection for themselves and their family members? Well, of course, it's the mosquito repellents and using it as directed. So we use DEET up to 30 percent. Lower, lower doses, of course, can be used. And we can use the permethrin on the clothing. We can use uh, other oil of eucalyptus. There are other brands and other names of products, but use it as directed, especially with children and, and pregnant women. 
so we're not going to overdose and you, would, you can use it on clothing, the permethrin uh, externally on clothing and uh, you wouldn't use it on the skin, the permethrin. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, these things, of course, are always on the, the labels, as you mentioned. We ought to take, uh, take a, a clear look at that. So are there other, uh, there are 67 counties in Florida. I assume that you as the director and other directors of the different counties uh, talk with one another with some regular basis or at least get immediate notification out. Um, is, 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 that's an assumption on my part. Is that correct? Well, in fact, every week, uh, the state, we update what we're doing in each of the counties. We actually had a summit yesterday, you might say. We had an exercise with the county folks and the, um, the emergency preparedness people on how we do it here in Orange County. And so we, we have plans, we exercise them. We talk to the other counties regularly. And, uh, you know, there are plans always being worked to figure out what we're doing, what are the best practices, what, what can we do better with respect to these diseases. And the mosquito control, I can tell you, in our area is really quite good compared to many areas of the state. Orange County in particular is as good as it gets. So I, I, I have confidence that we're doing it as well as it can be done here, especially with our large tourism population, um, which is unique. It's a unique situation we have here. It is, it is. So um, as we come to uh, the end of our segment here uh, in a second, are there uh, some particular things beyond putting appropriate lotions or sprays on you that you might recommend? Drain and cover. Mm -hmm. Drain and cover in English and Spanish for our community. Mm -hmm. Drain the standing water and, and cover um, you know, yourself with clothing uh, to protect yourself and even the bromeliad plants, those will collect water as well, drain all the time. Once a week, do patrol in your yard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where mosquitoes could be breeding. Yeah. So general mosquito breeding, uh, uh, things that we all know about, we, we need to take to the next level as far as actually following through on. We really do. So that would be one of the things we and, would. And be friendly to your mosquito control folks, let them on your property. That's right, that's right, that's good. Well, doctor, thank you so much for being with us uh, in this first segment. We are incredibly grateful for you updating us. So we hear so much about the Zika virus. So having an actual doctor come to our show and tell us a little bit about this is very, very uh, important uh, to us. So My thank pleasure. you thank so you. much. Thank We're going to go to a public service announcement at this point and uh, stay tuned. We'll be right back with some very important details I don't think you'll want to miss. Looks like it's done. Don't let salmonella get funky with your chicken. On average, one in six Americans will get a foodborne illness this year. You can't see these microbes, but they might be there. So learn the right temperature to cook each type of meat. Keep your family safe at foodsafety.gov. It's good to be with you again. Welcome to our special time that we have together as a community to talk about the issues. This is Joy in Our Town, and our segment is all about what is going on in our community, things that affect you right here. So today we have Dr. Kevin Shuren with us, who is the director of the Florida Department of Health here in Orange County. Welcome, Doctor. It's good to have you with us today. Thank you, Pat. Tell us a little bit uh, about uh, some of the special things that are going on in our area relevant to vaccines. We're going to talk about a very um, oh, uh, somewhat touchy thing uh, on vaccines. Tell us a little bit about what is a vaccine. Well, a vaccine is a preventative agent that helps to prevent disease. And we usually think of the childhood diseases, uh, chicken pox, measles, mumps, diphtheria, you know, whooping cough, otherwise known as pertussis. These are the quote vaccine preventable diseases. And the vaccines were first developed a long, long time ago. Um, I guess one of the first ones was the smallpox vaccine that goes back to the late 1700s. You know, Jenner and, and the cowpox, the smallpox vaccines. And then in the late 1800s, um, 
you know, pertussis and tetanus vaccines came along. And so we've had vaccines as a preventative in medicine for a long, long time. And then more and more of them have been added over time. And they've actually helped save many, many lives. Mm -hmm. So a vaccine specifically, is it, um, is my understanding right that you're giving a small dose of the problem, if you will, to a person and then they develop resistance to that? Or what, what is a vaccine actually? You could, you could put it in those words, and I would say this way. You're giving a protein in many instances, which helps the body develop immunity to the problem. You know, so the diseases are caused by bacteria or viruses, right? So you're giving either a killed virus or an attenuated virus that can no longer harm the person but that might allow the immune system to develop immunity toward that virus. Or in the case of a bacteria, you're giving an antigen or antigens, plural, that are little proteins that make up that capsule of the bacteria so that the body can develop immunity to it, right? So you're fooling the body into thinking, hey, this is the bacteria that I've got to fight now and I'm going to develop um, resistance to it. And the body then does develop that resistance. Mm. So our, our God-given immune system kicks in and does what it's, it's designed to do. Wow, it's amazing how God made the body, isn't it? That's right. <laughs> uh, well, what are, um, uh, so we, he we are hearing more uh, today, perhaps because in the past for many generations, people have viewed um, vaccines as good and they took it. Now, there seems to be some people who don't agree with the whole concept of vaccines. Tell us a little bit about uh, what you're hearing nowadays on the I should take it, I should not realm. Well, there was a, a gentleman in the United Kingdom whose name was Wakefield, and he came out with a study which uh, scared a lot of people, and it had to do with autism in children. So the autism spectrum disorder and, and he, he made a claim that autism spectrum disorder was linked to the measles vaccine. I believe that was what the claim was all about. And so a lot of moms and a lot of people across the United States became very concerned about that. Now an example of what happened out of that is a whole lot of series of studies went and looked at that subsequently and they were not able to come up with the same evidence as Dr. Wakefield did. In fact, I think Dr. Wakefield lost his, his medical license in, in the United Kingdom, in Great Britain, because they found out that his results were not verifiable. And even though it was published in the Lancet or the British Medical Journal, you know, there's a whole series of scientific papers that have come along since then. But many, many, many people believe Wakefield's study and they believe there's this link to autism spectrum disorder and, and the vaccines. Very hard to debunk. Now, in California, the vaccine rates in Marin County had dropped as low as 50%. So even in areas like our Seminole County, you're seeing the same trends where people are afraid of the vaccines. And now we then could have our own travelers come in and they have the measles because in Europe, the vaccine rates have fallen very, very low because of the Wakefield studies and so forth. And the children coming in have the measles because they're getting these diseases again. They're no longer getting immunizations. And in California, they had a terrible measles outbreak, right? Now, Dr. Pan in Sacramento came up with a, a legislation change and now they're requiring the vaccines again in California. And so unless there's a medical exemption in California, they're now requiring vaccines. They went to the opposite extreme. So we have the same phenomenon here. We have people today who don't want to get these vaccines. And yet I'm a physician and I know that without the vaccines, children are vulnerable, susceptible to these diseases. And I know that Dr. Wakefield falsified his information. So I have to tell you the truth and, be, and bear witness to it that that information was falsified. It was a false study. Right, so, um, so then just for clarification, um, uh, there's many people that are, if you will, conspiracy theorists. Correct. Um, and would say, well, that's the pharmaceutical companies that are promoting that, or that's the agenda of, uh, that we, sometimes we apply to politicians. They're trying to keep their kingdom going. Right. Um, 
but it, it uh, has not, a lot, there have not been any other studies, from what I'm hearing you say, that have verified his original outcomes. No, there haven't. And, you know, I know a lot of people have looked at it. Now, to be fair, there, there are a lot of children who are being born with autism spectrum disorder, and we don't completely understand it. Are there environmental factors? Are there reasons why the immune system, the immune system itself may be part of uh, autism spectrum disorder? We don't really know what causes it. So there are people who postulate that autism spectrum has something to do with the immune system. We don't really know. I'll be honest with you. We don't really know what causes autism spectrum disorder, but we have not found a link between that and vaccines, to well, be let completely me, let honest. Me, let me ask this question then. Um, there are many vaccines for many illnesses and diseases. Yes. Uh, correct? Okay. Um, is it safe to say that um, there are... Um, maybe five or ten percent of the vaccines given uh, that there are questions that they might relate to autism or uh, is it the full um, in other words maybe 85 percent of them there's no question and therefore we need to peel those 15 percent off and 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 push people on the 85 or or is there a problematic vaccine that we've been able to um, say, well, we're not totally sure on this particular one? The one that probably has the most question mark is the thimerosal-containing one, okay? So thimerosal is a mercury-containing substance that's used as a preservative in vaccine, and what they've done is to reduce the dosages of thimerosal in the vaccine, but they've not actually proven any link between the thimerosal, the mercury-containing, and the autism spectrum disorder. That, to my knowledge, is the only one that has been raised as a question. And I think they've actually made vaccines now that do not contain the thimerosal, right? So there are ways of getting around the thimerosal issue, if you will. But the thimerosal is the only one I'm aware of because it had mercury in it, just like mercury fillings. You know, is there a toxicity to mercury that we should be concerned about? Um, any toxins in the environment. These are very tiny amounts. We call it an adjuvant in the manufacturing of vaccines. So it's getting very technical. But yes, there's a tiny amount of mercury in what's called thimerosal that's used in, in manufacturing one of the type of vaccines. So using that as a uh, point, um, have, has there been um, evidence uh, in the dental community that uh, the mercury fillings, if you will, uh, do or potentially do have a higher risk for things of dementia or things where that, that, that are related to... Uh, um, uh, I would not sicknesses. be qualified to answer that because I'm not a dental physician, mm -hmm. so I would have to refer you to a dental physician. Okay, I didn't know if the mercury was, but, was able to be but mercury. You know, we, in public health, we talk about mercury and fish and, you know, limiting yourself to two, two, uh, two fish a week as far as what you eat because there's a certain amount of mercury in the fish. If you were to eat fish out of Lake Apopka, for example, you know, we, we don't recommend eating more than two fish a week because of certain amounts of mercury they're in. But you don't see that correlation necessarily carrying through in the vaccine community to somebody that weighs six pounds or not six pounds, but say uh, 15 pounds or something of that nature. No, I mean, you know, the American Academy of Pediatrics has got the expertise and the CDC's Immunization Practices Committee. If people want to look into this in, in great depth, I would refer them to cdc.gov. Good. or flhealth.gov to get more information on the vaccine safety issues, and those are reputable. There's also immunize.org is another reputable website that looks at these sorts of issues. But the scientific evidence does not seem to support any links with autism spectrum disorder, and that seems to be the weight of the evidence at this point in time. That's good. Well, thank you for clearing that up. Let me um, zero in <clears throat> just in, in the couple minutes that we have left. Um, we have so many people visiting our big attractions here. Um, so we do have these people coming in who uh, are, are not vaccined, uh, have not been exposed to vaccines. And as you mentioned, there seems to be a trend locally toward a lessening of the percentage of vaccines. 
Should a parent be concerned about their children being around other children who have not been vaccinated um, at their schools, day schools, church nurseries, uh, where, where children are gathering, if you will? Yes, and you know, we have had deaths, okay? So we've had, we had uh, I wanna say in 2014, I recall a child that died of pertussis, whooping cough, and uh, flu. So we, we have deaths of children from vaccine preventable diseases today. We talk about cocooning children. There are children at a certain age which they're not even eligible yet for vaccines, let's say six weeks, all right? Six weeks, the infant. So, you know, even grandparents, all right? Doesn't matter our age. We have to be concerned about have we had our, our TDP? Have we had the pertussis even in older age groups if we're around grandchildren? right, the grandbabies and so forth, because we have to be cocooned to protect these children if they haven't got the immunity yet. Now, moms have breast milk that will protect the babies or the mom's immunity from the womb will protect the babies for a certain length of time. But until the babies develop their immunity, you know, that's part of what the vaccines are going to be able to do. Mm. So we have, to, we have to protect them during that vulnerable childhood period. You look at the cemeteries from many years ago here in Florida or in the colonies, you can see where children did not make it out. Did of not make it out. Well, right. Well, um, we only have a few seconds left, and I do want to say thank you so much for coming and enlightening us on uh, this very important um, area where there's been much discussion. And so we're so grateful for you uh, coming and sharing with us, and we're grateful for you tuning in to us at Joy in Our Town. This program has been sponsored by the Trinity Broadcasting Network and is made possible by your telethon dollars. Your continual support can keep Joy in Our Town coming to your home every week. Write to Joy in Our Town, Post Office Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711.